I invite you to just sit back, open your hearts, open your minds, and be totally receptive to the wonderful message that God is bringing forth now through our beloved Reverend John. Please welcome him. Good morning, friends. Can we affirm together, I believe, I have faith, I trust. I believe, I have faith, I trust. I'm not convinced. I believe, I have faith, I trust. And so, I believe, I have faith, and I trust that you are all heirs this morning. It's child month, and the master said, we can become as little children. Well, he said, except you become as a little child, you cannot experience the kingdom of heaven. So I've titled my talk this morning, We Can Become As Little Children. No kidding. You know, it is said that young children laugh as much as 100 to 200 times a day, compared to a large majority of people who only get zero to a few. Yet laughter, as you know, is good not only for the body, but also for the soul and the spirit. And since this is Child Month, I'm enjoying several emails that my colleagues in Census of Spiritual Living have sent, which underscore the wit, wisdom, and above all, the faith, honesty, and humor of young children. So I, gave, I want to give you a couple to, to begin. And let me say that I am so overjoyed to, to welcome those who listen to us on the internet as well. A Sunday school teacher was discussing the Ten Commandments with her five and six year olds. And after explaining the commandment, quote, to honor thy father and thy mother, she asked, is there a commandment that teaches us how to treat our brothers and sisters? Without missing a beat, one little boy answered, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Here's another. Little Johnny asked his grandma how old she was. How many of you grandmas have been asked that? Mm-hmm. Grandma answered, oh, darling, 39 and holding. <laughs> Johnny thought for a moment and then said, grandma, how old would you be if you let go? <laughs> I wonder how old we would be if we just let go. <laughs> Children can do that, can't they? They state their wishes and needs, they express their anger and their, their pain, and then they just let go. When it comes to faith, to trusting life, they have us beaten hands down. And I want to say how, how thrilled I was this morning to arrive at 8.30 and to be greeted by one of our young adults, Zari Saunders, in the vestibule. She's our, one of our ushers this morning. Isn't that just wonderful? Yes. Is that just wonderful? Yes. Let us give her, some of you know the laughing yoga, the laughing yoga sign of approval. Um, you, you clap your hands, keeping them even, so that you, you activate all the acupressure points. And you do it three times. You go, very good, very good, very good. And then you throw your hands in the air and say, yay! Let's do it three times. Very good, very good, very good, yay! Very good, very good, very good, yay! Give it to somebody. Very good, very good, very good, yay! If you don't feel like a picnic now. <laughs> so this morning, I want us to spend some time looking at how we can rediscover the childlike faith and trust in life that children possess naturally. And this is a true story by an unknown author. Tess was a precocious eight-year-old when she heard her mom and dad talking about her little brother, Andrew. All she knew was that he was very, very sick, and they were completely out of money. They were moving to an apartment complex next month because daddy didn't have the money for the doctor bills and their house. 
Only a very costly surgery could save Andrew now, and it was looking like there was no one to loan them the money. She heard Daddy say to her tearful mother with whispered desperation, oh God, only a miracle can save him now. Tess went to her bedroom, into the back of her closet, took out her piggy bank, smashed it, and emptied the money on her bed. She counted it very carefully, three times. Ah, and she put that money in her, her little purse, and she slipped out the back door, and just down the road, half a block away, was a pharmacy, and she went into the pharmacy, clutching her purse, and the pharmacist was on the phone. Is Noel Chisholm in church this morning? Because she's my favorite pharmacist. We have, a, we have one of everything in the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. It's wonderful. So Tess went to the pharmacy. It wasn't Noel's pharmacy, though. And the pharmacist was on the phone talking to a friend. And so Tess waited impatiently, you know, and nervously. She had something she wanted to say to the pharmacist. And eventually she said, <coughs> he paid her a new mind. After all, it's only a little child. What could she want? Eventually she said, she banged her a quarter on the counter and said, and he looked up impatiently and said, yes, what is it? What is it? And she said, I wish to purchase a miracle. He said, I really can't speak to you right now. I'm on, I'm on an important telephone call. She said, this is important. He said, I'm talking to my brother. She said, I want to talk to you about my brother. And I'm here to purchase a miracle. Well, he, she said, he's, something is really wrong with him. And he needs a miracle. And I've come for it. And that softened him a little. But as he was hanging up, his brother, who was in the pharmacy, a well-dressed, elegant gentleman, walked over and said to Tess, hello. What can we do for you today? And Tess said, how much is a miracle? And this gentleman said, how much do you have? And she said, I have a dollar and 11 cents. But, but, but I can get more. I can get more. If I need more, I need to purchase a miracle. So the gentleman said, hmm, let me see. What kind of miracle do you need? She said, I'm not sure, but my brother is very sick. There's something wrong in his head. And, and, and my father says he needs a miracle. So I'm here to buy one. The farm, the, the well-dressed gentleman said, hmm, this is really a wonderful coincidence. You know, it's a dollar and 11 cents is exactly the right price for a miracle. Why don't you take me home so I can meet your mom and dad and, and meet your brother, and we'll see what kind of miracle he needs. And off he went. He took her little hand in his, and she led him down the, the road half a block to her parents' house. The well-dressed gentleman um, was a neurosurgeon, I'm trying to find his name, it's called Dr. Carlton Armstrong, specializing in neurosurgery. And the operation was completed without charge. It wasn't long until Andrew was home again and doing very well, and mom and dad were happy, of course, and talking about the chain of events, the peculiar chain of events that led them to this place. And Andrew's aunt was visiting, and she said, this must have cost a fortune. I wonder how much it cost. Tess smiled. She knew exactly how much a miracle cost. It cost $1.11, plus the faith of a little child. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Yay! The faith of a little child. Joan Borisenko, who is one of my favorite authors, in her marvelous little book, Seven Paths to God, points to a penetrating study by Harvard theologian James Fowler on how we develop faith and its relationship to our psychological development. And I thought you'd find this interesting, because according to this eminent researcher, studies show that we actually invent God in our own image. Or to be more precise, we invent God in the image of our parents. If we had abusive, neglectful, or unreliable, or critical parents, we are likely to grow up with low self-esteem and a concept of God as punitive, judgmental, and petty, just like our parents were. On the other hand, if our parents were loving and supportive, we are likely to grow up with high self-esteem and imagine a God who, like our parents, is beneficent, compassionate, 
and supportive of us. As we mature psychologically over the lifespan, if we are able to heal the wounds to our sense of self, our idea of God, and thus our faith, undergoes systematic changes. According to Fowler, there are six stages of psychospiritual growth in religion, in relationship to faith. Before the age of seven, he, he, he postulates, little children live in an imaginative world populated by angels, fairies, demons, and monsters. In addition, children before the age of seven imitate the people around them and assume their beliefs. This explains to me why so many of our people are frightened of lizards in a country that liz where lizards abound. We learn it without a word being said from our caregivers at a very early age. Think of the implications of this then. If a child lives in a frightening household or is exposed to the traditional concepts of a fire and brimstone god, those early images become deeply ingrained in their psyche and can create a fear-based faith which keeps them living in fear of the wrath of God. They may in fact be imprisoned all their lives by the neurological traces left from an abusive and fearful early childhood. Between seven and puberty, children go through a second stage of psychological development in which they tend to see things in black and white, good and evil, fair and unfair. In this stage, Stories and myths are interpreted literally, and the child demands reciprocity. Their faith during this stage rests in the concept of what is fair, a concept of reward and punishment in which God is a bit like Santa Claus, rewarding you when you are good and withholding the goodies if you are bad. At puberty, young people enter a third developmental stage in which they begin to think for themselves. It is at this time that we begin to look beyond the beliefs of our family and to, be, and to embrace the beliefs of our peers. Our faith now becomes an extension of our interpersonal relationships and the need to be acceptable and to fit in, to be one of the crowd, conforming to the judgments of one's peer group. And those of you who have anything to do with, with teens know how strong that can be. I've, incidentally, Reverend Sonia just sent me a, a very interesting article about why people stop coming to church. And one of the things it says, well, it gives five reasons, and one of the five reasons why people stop coming to church is the fact that they come to church looking for God and can't find it. I'm so happy that here at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living, we learn to find God where God really is, within and, and all around. So as life progresses into adulthood, a fourth stage unfolds. We begin to develop the capacity to reflect on ourselves as individuals and to face the inevitable tensions between who we are and what people want us to be. Anybody here resonates with that? A lot of times there is pressure on us to be what our parents didn't have or didn't or weren't able to do themselves, and they live vicariously through us, insisting that we be this or that when we really are something entirely different. Tensions between what we believe and what others want us to believe, and of course the big frog, tensions between gratifying our own needs vis-a-vis -vis being of service to others. Often it is in this stage that we become disillusioned with previous linear and narrow concepts about God and begin to seek more multi-leveled approaches to faith. And this is why I'm so thrilled that our young adults, under the, the guidance of Auntie Carmen Clark and Uncle Stevie Golding, are coming together in a sense of community to see how, how this whole business of a faith-based activity, known as the Temple of Light Center of Spiritual Living, applies to their lives and can provide them with a sense of spiritual community and belonging and usefulness and worthiness and worthwhileness. So that's stage four. The fifth stage of our psychospiritual spiritual development uh, involves us becoming familiar with the paradoxes that life holds. As Fowler puts it, we are simultaneously alone, alone and all one. We are able to discern powerful truths and at the same time appreciate their relativity. 
For example, the stories and myths of the Bible's description of our relationship with God reach us, metaphorically, through the language of spirit, and we feel comfortable with the idea that every word need not be taken literally in order for us to, to pursue a meaningful spiritual practice. And this was one of the things that we found last Thursday at the Bible class. If you take it literally, you're going to be in trouble because most of the language is allegorical and meant to have a, another meaning, not just the literal meaning of, of what we're reading in the story. So Fowler says there is there's some tension in this fifth stage of faith because we live caught between an untransformed world and a transforming vision of what we know the world could be. And how many of us know disillusioned young people who just think, wow, you know, it's a bunch of hypocrites and they, they say one thing but they do another. Ever encountered that? Yeah. But the sixth stage, at a stage that, that too few people reach, the sixth stage of faith is what Fowler calls universalizing faith. And he consider, considers it relatively rare. It is the faith of the Doris farmer, and some of you know this story, a Doris farmer who lived in ancient China. The farmer had a single horse to help plowing his field, and so was considered well off by the townspeople. Then one spring morning, his horse ran off. And all the townspeople gathered and said, oh my goodness, this is terrible. And the farmer simply said, maybe. The next morning, his horse returned, leading an entire herd of wild mustangs. And so all the villagers were ecstatic. Wow, you're the luckiest man and the richest man in the whole world. Look at all the, all the horses you have. They really all exalted. But all the farmer said was, maybe. The following morning, the farmer's only son awoke at dawn to begin breaking in one of the wild horses. It promptly threw him, and his leg was broken. The townspeople rushed over, oh dear, this is tragic, your only son, now you won't have anybody to help you plant, this is tragic. And the farmer said, maybe. The next afternoon, the emperor's soldiers rode into the town, kicking up an enormous cloud of dust. They had come to conscript all the able-bodied young men into war. And of course, the farmer's son could not go because of his broken leg. The townspeople gathered around to marvel at the farmer's good luck, but all he said was, maybe. The story continues in the same fashion through many other episodes, illustrating the importance of non-attachment to outcomes and its relationship to faith. The farmer knew that everything is in divine order, whether we see it immediately or not. Like a practicing religious scientist, his faith was based on the knowledge that the universe conspires creatively for life to grow and evolve. How did little Tess just know that she could buy a miracle? And what made the one person that, that spoke to her at the pharmacy turn out to be a, 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 a neurosurgeon? Isn't that just how the universe just, just moves on our behalf all the time, if only we will believe. So instead of labeling events, good or bad, we simply have to let go. Not 39 and holding, not 40 and holding, not 70 and holding, but letting go and letting God. Securing the knowledge that all things work together for greater good, and I'm not kidding. People who reach the stage of universalizing faith have the ability to perceive the larger whole that is greater than the sum of its parts, while at the same time possessing the simple trust in life which children have. They come full circle to being able to let go and trust the universe to support them. The beautiful Jesus is the one that said, unless we become as little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven really means a place of peace and joyful fulfillment in our lives. Not in some geographic location far off after we die, but right here, right now, where we are. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, writes in the Science of Mind textbook on page 456, and I quote, the life of the child is lived in natural goodness. God is natural goodness. 
We must turn, we must return the way we came. And that's what is meant by repentance, to turn around and look at where it is we really should be going. As little children, we know that life is good and to be trusted, and we are to approach our problems as though they were not. This is, this is, this is Holmes talking. Approaching them in this manner, they will vanish. End of that quote. Journalist Ellen Ratner, writing for worldnetdaily.com, noted, and I quote, I have traveled the world over to know this one truth. There is no force of nature as powerful as the joy of a child. Children have the gift of being able to laugh and play through war, economic despair, natural disaster, disease, and hunger. Their magical power to transform their environment has been recorded for thousands of, thousands of years. And the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 11:6 says, a little child shall lead them. Which brings me to your assignment. You thought you were going to escape an assignment? Never. I wake up at four in the morning full of ideas for assignments, some of which would be impossible for you to undertake. Your assignment, should you decide to undertake it this week, is to let go of all the cares and concerns and paradoxes of life and spend just 20 minutes of your time playing a child's game that you perhaps haven't done for years. If you have kids or grandkids, that will be quite easy. Ask them to take out the snakes and ladders or Chinese checkers. If you don't have kids with whom to play, make up a game. Build a house of cards with a deck of cards. Remember when you did that, you balanced them on top of each other very delicately. And then a breath of air went, and they all went, and you had to start all over again. Do that for 20 minutes this week and see what it does to your, your psyche and how you feel about yourself. Just do something childlike. When last anybody, remember Jax? I used to love jacks. Yeah. If you go to the pharmacy and find a game, a, a game of jacks or a yo-yo bite, you might imagine you're walking into office. Saying, Morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or if you walk into your boss's office and say, "Want to play a game of jacks?" What? Well, I had a, I had a choice. Either to ask you for a raise of pay or to play a game of jacks. <laughs> Do something childlike this week. And the second part of your assignment is every evening, sing yourself a lullaby or a nursery rhyme at bedtime. I like the Brahms lullaby, but anyone will do. And don't tell me that some of you have forgotten your nursery rhymes. Everybody remembers one. You remember Farmer in the Dell? Maestro? Valerie, remember Farmer in the Dell? The Farmer in the Dell. Hey ho, the cherry ho, oh, the farmer in the dell. The farmer in the wine, the farmer takes the wine. Hey ho, the
Let us affirm together, I let the little child within me lead me into pathways of love, laughter, and joy. I let the little child within me lead me into pathways of love, laughter, and joy. To your neighbor say, can the little child within you come out and play with me? Can the little child within you come out and play with me? And together we all say, very good, very good, very good, yay! Namaste. Oh.